and I will tell you why we want it. We want it because it is our right, first of all. No class of men, and I would add women, can, without insulting their own nature, be content with deprivation, any deprivation, of their rights. Douglas concluded the statement by saying, we want it again as a means for educating our race. But what is it that we want? The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. answered this question in a speech of which we're all familiar, called I Have a Dream. But the original speech was delivered in the Detroit area with powerful imagery well before the march in Washington. In the original I Have a Dream speech, it is a speech where Dr. King actually answered the question of what it is that we want. The question that's been asked by Africans brought to unfamiliar land as laborers and later as slaves in the 16th and 17th centuries. The, the same question that was asked uh, by slaves seeking rights like Dred Scott. The same question that was asked by bus and train travelers seeking rail passage such as Homer Plessy. The same question asked by countless others in the experience of this freedom project. Dr. King replied to the ancestors, we want all of our rights, we want them here, yeah, we and we want them, them now. now. He said that God is not interested in the freedom of black men, brown men, and yellow men. No, God is interested in the freedom of the human race. And the question of what blacks and others want benefits us now today. And so the question of what it is that we want, what it is that we want is answered. We want all of our rights, we want them here, and we want them now. King, of course, is an extraordinary human being. His words bellow, of course, loudly in our ears ever so often. And we turn to him, he is a pastor after all, to make sense of our trials and to give us hope for tomorrow's unknowns. But many of us have really not come to terms of what he represented and who he really was. I think we've failed, actually, to see King for himself. No, not how he's memorialized and not the one or two excerpts from his speeches that we claim to know. Not in the way that the historical dramas depict him, but to know King for himself requires us to know his passion, his mission, not just his dream. And his mission was organized activism. His mission was to get us to move now. His fierce urgency mission was to put a pep in our step for the next battle. This is who he was and this is what he offered as one example. He regularly questioned our commitment to the Freedom Project. He was aware of our liberalism and our faux multiculturalism. He was aware of our fervent love for political correctness, our prioritization of our individual safety versus our collective healing. He was mighty aware of white anxiety and black passivity. But what can the legacy of activists like King and so many others offer us in an era where, for example, black excellence was replaced by white fragility in the People's White House. What can the legacy of activists like King offer us? We can start, of course, to have a minority success, as we have seen, academics, many of us here, CEOs, presidents, Oscar winners, at least a few more of us this year. We have a tendency to believe the Freedom Project is over when we see these examples of minority success. We have, have a tendency to believe that the marches can cease and that the Freedom Project is in fact complete. But the reality is, we also know that police have killed more unarmed citizens in the first two months of 2017 than has ever been recorded. In just the span of 50 something days. And we allow our attention to drift away. We allow the media to distract us from what really matters in our neighborhoods, in our kids' lives, in our futures, our city's goals, and our collective progress. We become complicit takers of the media myth to watch and to listen and to watch again everywhere and every day. They claim that we can afford to miss it. But what's really being reported on? We're just a couple hundred years past Jamestown where blacks arrived on the shores of America as property, chattel, picking cotton that produced the labor that built this country. We're just a few decades beyond the barking dogs and the water hoses. We're just 125 years past the Emancipation Proclamation, only decades after Little Rock Nine and the San Francisco State Strikers of to go to school, fought to go to Woolworths, fought to go to Walgreens without discrimination. Even when the opposition would have rather shut schools 
down than to let us in. And today, 45 years after the founding of this, the world's oldest and I dare I say greatest ethnic studies organization, those same people, those same hands that were spit on, those same hands that picked cotton, started picking presidents, started picking governors, started becoming leaders in music and art and business and politics, but that is not enough. Select prosperity for ethnic communities does not cancel out the far more pervasive racial and ethnic misery. For King was a pastor, as an example, and many of the activists who made ethnic studies real in classrooms, real on street corners, and in publications, many of them did in fact believe in Isaiah, the same Isaiah in the Bible that bellowed to do justice is a commandment. For Isaiah bluntly reminds us that to keep ye judgment and to do justice. But what does it mean to actually do justice? I think clearly here, justice is an action. Justice requires us to do something, to move, to do, to act. So we must continue to believe in a, a United States of America that doesn't just grow old, but that grows up. And we must help this country realize what it has said about itself. And often that means diving in the righteous fights to make justice a reality. And so we fight because we must do justice. We fight, yes, because black lives really do matter. Yes, native lives really do matter. Yes, Latinx lives really do matter. Yes, Asian Pacific Islander lives really do matter. And yes, queer lives really do matter. But that is just a saying for most of us. For most of us, it's just a storyline that you see on your TV. The Lives Matter movement is just a movement most of us are watching from the comfort of our armchairs and our living rooms. It's just our Twitter hashtags. It's just our Facebook posts. And that's not leadership. That's plain old lazy activism. And the legacy of ethnic studies, I argue, demands that we must go further. Cesar Chavez's dream was not about Latino wealth. King's dream was not about black wealth. Grace Lee Boggs' dream was not about Asian wealth. That's not it. Neither, I think, would shun black progress or native growth or Latinx or black wealth. I think they'd say it's great, but then I suspect that they would ask, what are we doing for others with that success? I think they'd say, Oprah's great, we love her, Eva Mendez is beautiful and wonderful, but what about the two and five kids growing hungry and going to bed every night? What about the prisons for profit? What about the lead in our water? And how do we make these iconic voices seriously matter in this moment of paradox? This moment of paradox where we have seen success for some that is overexposed and misery for most that goes ignored and unnoticed by you and by me nearly every day. Don't think I'm just talking about the quote unquote system. Don't think I'm just talking about people in Washington. I'm also critiquing you and me. How many times last week did we see a homeless person in need and turn a blind eye? How many times today did you think about yourself before you thought about others? I don't think that we can reduce ethnic studies and its champions, many of whom are in this room today, to some romanticized view of American democracy that somehow absolves you and me of our responsibility too. If we claim to be about social justice, we must be about doing justice. We must heed the call to not just be woke, but to be awake. You can't stay woke if you weren't awake to begin with. You can't reconcile racial differences or class differences or sexual orientation differences or language differences unless you first consile to begin with. You can't redo something you never first did initially. And this, I think, is ethnic studies' first fierce urgency of now in 2017. So I suggest that we should not just stay woke, but we've gotta be awake. Do not just be aware, we must do justice. So many people have asked me as a political scientist what we can do. Too many seem to be unsure about how they can in fact impact change. And I suggest that we can start by listening. And moreover, we can never forget that there is always a connection between and among communities of difference. 
There's a direct connection between your abolition of prison work and the goals of others engaged in improving public education. There's a deep link between those fighting environmental racism and those seeking to elect politicians that reflect the interests of marginalized Americans. So we must work together. We must go to each other's group meetings. We must fight in each other's rallies. We must stand in the gap for the old and the young, weak, the weak and the strong, the rich and the poor, and we must move beyond our own dreams. Because most people's dreams are never known, they're never told, and they're never shared. We actually forget to document the stories, for example, of our elderly. We wait until they're long gone in the casket to call them ancestors. But we must reclaim and tell their stories now. I suggest we need to get out our iPhones and record their stories when you're with them. Incorporate them into your Facebook posts, for not everyone's witness counts the same. People with Alzheimer's cannot tell their own stories. Black moms complaining in Flint did little to make an impact in the poisonous lead in the city's water. Why? Because no one cared, because the kids were poor and the moms were black. So tell someone else's story. If you're doing NAACP work, connect with folks who are doing environmental work. If your focus is on gender equity, you need to connect with those folks doing race work because the dream is universal and there is a connection. You can't talk about race and gender without talking about sexual identity. You can lift up some aspects of our scripted identities while also ignoring others. But you can't do that and claim to do justice. Not if you are actually interested in making real our opportunity now to make ethnic studies fierce urgency of now actually real. The legacy of ethnic studies isn't just about getting Americans to listen to other folks. We must get America to listen to itself. We and only we can make America accountable to itself. Only we can get America to truly ensure that all are created equal. Only we can get this country to truly ensure that equal, and just, equal justice under the law matters for everyone. And I know. I know that this work is very difficult because the reality is it's never happened. But it's not impossible. And despite the current moment, particularly in this Trump era, we, I believe, I must believe, can truly make it happen. But it does require us to stop romanticizing. It requires us to start working. We have to stop merely celebrating our success at convenings like this every year and we need to honor the legacy of the righteous activists that came before by doing justice work. And we must be willing to self-reflect, for example, as King did, after we have had failures, like the failures that King had in Albany, Georgia, because not every fight we will win. And we must be willing to self-criticize, and we must be willing to do so publicly for the good of the Freedom Project that will require all of us to engage if it is to ever be truly realized. We must not ever forget how what we achieved occurred and what we have, in fact, accomplished. Our past mistakes and our successes really do both inform our current justice work. And in that effort, I think we must be willing to self-criticize and to learn from our past. Since I was a child, I have been a pragmatic liberal progressive. When I first started oratorical speeches, even at that young age, my sister and dad can attest who are here today, uh, those speeches I critique whites and blacks, because that's the main audience in the Midwest, on their decisions not to be, uh, not in the best interest of a short term, in other words, within our lifetimes, civil rights agenda. And I'm not going to stop now because we are all responsible and we must be willing to self-criticize and learn from our past, which also it for the dirty lustis last November when we had the chance. And the ugly result, we know now. And so our work must begin anew today and every day. And I ask us to ponder the question of what will justice in minority communities look like in the Trump era. Think about that. You know, there was a time in this country when any white person 
who was liked by the KKK would have been repudiated by any minority. Clearly, this reality no longer exists, as 8% of blacks and 29% of Latinos voted for Trump. And thousands more voted for third party candidates in battleground states, which can only mean that many people of color, frankly, did not do everything that we could to ensure that the KKK endorsed candidate did not win. And I guess I'm supposed to ignore the fact that in key middle ground, battle, Midwest battleground states, that Democratic minority voters did not come out like in past elections in places like Detroit and Milwaukee and Philly. And I guess I'm just supposed to ignore the white resentment, not rational choice, motivated many Trump supporters. I think we've got to be more responsible with our rhetoric in our social justice and activist circles. It's clear that a combination of factors heavily contributed to a large number of people of color not voting. And yes, our anti-two-party, anti-capitalist rhetoric, our op-eds, our television commentaries, and our celebrity attitudes, think Colin Kaepernick, sorry San Francisco, who didn't even vote, all of that had a role to play. I've labeled this problem in some of my research as post-civil rights era progressive activist privilege. The false belief that people of color in 2017 currently have the luxury of choosing individual beliefs over what's best for the group as a whole for the next four years. We could have beat hate in this last election, but instead, many of us, to be honest, were fighting each other. And many of us voted for individual beliefs, and we egregiously used our social media platform to convince others like us that what, that what we believed individually was right for everyone. But we're just told to blame white racists. And I argue, no, it is in fact, people of color could have built a firewall against this outcome in three cities alone, in Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania, and we did not. Too many of us stayed home. And the question is why? I think the tragic irony now is that the anti-racism that so many of us fought against all last year is now embodied in the 40, and none of us wanna be held accountable. We want to blame Trump's overperformance among uneducated whites. We want to blame white racial resentment, but that's really an incomplete story. That view absolves us of any responsibility in Trump's ascendancy to the presidency. And as Dr. King said in 63, man's inhumanity to man is not only perpetuated by the vitriolic actions of those who are bad, it's also perpetuated by the vitiating inaction of those who are good. And as you already know, we are either part of the problem or we are part of the solution. And so what will activism look like in the Trump presidency? I hope it looks something that is improved upon from the mistakes of 2016. One such mistake was our social media engagement re regularly decrying Clinton simply because many of us did not like her. The shock the day after the election from so many of us leftist liberals on social media, uh, black, white, native, Latinx, and others, each of us that have thousands of followers, many of us woke up to the reality that our months of anti-Clinton rhetoric may have impacted the election results and we claim to be so astounded. Many so-called freedom chasers and justice doers spent the entire campaign encouraging people to vote for those with no chance of winning, or even worse, to not vote at all. And our failure to see the importance of getting something, no matter how small, versus nothing at all, has in part now led to generations of setbacks. No, we aren't just talking about four years of disaster. We're talking about hundreds of lifetime judicial appointments. We're talking about no health care for the average American to afford, even though the Obamacare repeal is likely to fail today. Don't believe for a minute that the Republicans will let the fight end. We're talking about the removal of EPA regulations that mandate clean water standards and so much more. And yes, as you can probably tell, I'm still mad. And I'm mad really at myself. Uh, it's a, my job, I believe, as an educator to ensure that we have the tools necessary to make right decisions. And frankly, in 2016, pragmatism and an unliked woman potential president would have hands down been better than what we've got. 
and it would have brought us closer to realizing the dream of many of the ethnic studies champions from decades ago. But we got caught up on whether or not we liked somebody. So many folks have told me that they just assumed that Clinton would win, even though they voted for someone else. And many of these voters are persons of color. They're young, they're educated, and they live in battleground states. They claim that they were interested, many of them, in voting against the two-party system, against the quote-unquote system, to quote-unquote tell them that they just can't ignore us any longer. And all of that, I argue, was now lost completely in a landslide failure to the common opposition that we couldn't even, would not even coalesce around. Even after the KKK official newspaper endorsed this man, and none of us want to be held accountable. We just want to blame Trump's performance among whites. All of which is as much part of the story as the underperformance of Clinton with minorities. I still believe that we could have beat hate in this election, and we did not. Many of us voted our individual beliefs, and that decision, I argue, was misinformed. Assuming that we care about short-term goals, about anti-black racism or civil rights or social justice and the like, and I feel odd as a political scientist because I'm allegedly told that I'm supposed to ignore my education, my training, evidence, facts, and understanding to blame white racists. And the fact is, that's not the complete story. We are also responsible, but we alone are not responsible. But when we alone could have prevented this outcome in three cities alone, we're talking about like 100,000 votes. We need to understand why we didn't. Obviously, we all agree that Clinton was not the best candidate and her campaign was flawed in many, many, many ways. But why do we pretend as though we've got the luxury today, at this moment in history, to splinter our votes. Is it our middle class privilege? Is it ironically our own respectability politics? Why do we wrongly think we can splinter our vote as a minority community and win? Again, this last election was about turnout and consequences and the consequences for those of us who live and bleed the values of ethnic studies and ethnic activism, those consequences were and are enormous. We literally let a KKK endorsed person win, y'all. Democrats lost this election more than Republicans won it, but it's necessary for us to seriously debrief it. Because in, as many of us know who do this work every day in our respective communities, social justice difficult dialogues, we always debrief. And we clearly need to do so now so that we can build a unified collective game plan for the next stage of social justice movement throughout 2017. We have to know our history and its importance. For example, the fact that there has always been disagreement between activist groups like the Black Panther Party or SNCC or the NAACP or SELC, but when it mattered most, they worked together. And often, they made uncomfortable decisions and uncomfortable votes in elections for what was best for the group as a whole. We failed in November, and our failure was bigger than King's failure in Albany. Our failure will impact generations. And many people since the election have not been helpful at all. Scholar Cornel West wrote recently that he believes that idea of neoliberalism died with Obama's departure. And West is simply flat out wrong. And he is showing a lack of understanding of American minority politics more and more every day that he believes that any centuries-long institutional project like neoliberalism can just suddenly fall by the wayside with one election, ignore the strength of its influence in judicial affairs and in other institutions. It also mistakenly implies that such a powerful force is able to be transformed so easily. And the same flaw logic, I dare, uh, follows many of the Bernie or Bust supporters who argued that it was plausible should he had won. But wait, we're told, we should blame the white women. No, I don't think we should, solely. Yes, white voters voted overwhelmingly for Trump, 
But why is that a surprise? First, he ran as a Republican. Second, he was endorsed by the KKK, a white supremacist nationalist terrorist organization. Third, the country's eligible voters are still majority white. This should not have been a surprise to anyone, I argue, especially not to black people, especially not to queer people, especially not to native people or Latinx people and so on. Instead of assuming Clinton would win, freedom fighters in the spirit of ethnic activism, I argue, should have assumed, albeit egregiously, that most whites would vote for the white man. That's what the vast majority of them have done for the last 43 presidents. But I'm supposed to ignore the fact that many of my own personal friends, friends of color, voted for Stein or Johnson or someone else, irrelevant. I'm supposed to ignore the fact that my passion for politics and education in the field uh, failed in convincing them of the importance of stability because they've been duped into, into believing that now is the time for a protest vote. Duped into believing that a more progressive nominee would have fared better. Now, from the Midwest, and I assure you that would not have happened. Duped into believing that the best way to stick it to the two-party system was to vote for a third-party candidate. Duped into believing that elections, especially for people of color, are about voting your individual conscience versus voting what is best for the group in the short term. Duped into believing that a vote against Clinton was a morally right thing to do. And I argue perhaps it was for themselves and for their own individual psyches, but not for the group. Should have the Democratic Party, for example, done substantially more to court voters of color? Absolutely. Despite high turnout among black women, should have other voters of color and ethnic communities have had to yet again step in to save the country from disaster? The same country that steps on them time and time again? No, I don't think so. But should have all of us swallowed our pain and done it again anyway? Yes, I believe we should have. Do I wish we had a clearer understanding of the political dynamics to make ever more informed decisions, however compromising, to move the agenda forward, even when we're being shunned and ignored? Absolutely. Do I like it? No. Is it fair? No. Is it our responsibility alone? No. Yes, it is. It's catching if you're listening. Mm -hmm. The marginalized young people, college students, immigrants, we have been the moral conscience of this nation and, and have answered that call that we never asked for. And it was so vitally important that we did so again last November. Our common foe was the KKK endorsed candidate in an era where white supremacists are more of a threat to this country than ISIS. And we're too easily distracted. And we cannot afford to limit our activisms to the news cycle. Whether it's green beans, potatoes, and tomatoes, which I don't really care much anymore for, given her comments lately, or false reports from social media sites, or what some celebrity recently did, each time we veer away from the Freedom Project, another life is lost, and we simply can't afford that now nor ever. Just remember, I argue, and I hope we will, come November 2018, for most of us, in my state of Virginia, it's coming up this current November, where the House of Representatives and U.S. Senate is who you vote or not for. Just remember, come your state legislative body elections, because they determine the House congressional district boundaries, and this matters too. You don't like Congress? You don't like Congress because the way the lines are drawn. The lines are drawn by the state legislatures, which means you got to be involved in your state legislature elections. I do believe this too shall pass because I'm a hopeful person. But in the meantime, far too many children's lives we made much more difficult until then. Just look at our current Secretary of Education. And I also encourage us to not let Trump's Twitter antics keep us from remembering what's really going on. GOP racism and misogyny and sexism and so many other isms is alive and well. It's alive and well in a 70 plus year old white man who couldn't even stand to hear Coretta Scott King's words during uh, Sessions AG nomination. The same Sessions who has two names, not one, two names after Confederate racist generals. And during Black History Month, nonetheless, and they silenced Elizabeth Warren, 
not only because she was speaking truth to power, but they silenced her because she is a woman. So we must fight, and we must fight hard. And I ask us to really ask this question consistently. Where is the resistance in our communities? King reminds us, we want all of our rights, we want them here, we want them now. And so I hope to encourage all of us to not let our dreams be restricted when we're arrested at the rally, or when we are hungry, or when our condition makes it difficult for us to fight. Do not let our dreams apply to you. And I really hope that we don't let Trump frustrate us into none action. We simply cannot afford it. Not if we claim to care about the lives of ordinary Americans everywhere. We can have more ambitious dreams than the world encourages us to dream. We don't have to only dream for better prisons. We can dream of no prisons. We can have healing instead of punishment. We don't have to just dream where rape victims are believed. We can dream a world where rape doesn't exist. We don't have to just dream for an end to police brutality. We can dream a world where police aren't even needed. What did the lessons of the last presidential election tell us in 2017? How can our ancestral and current champions of the Freedom Project help us think about this current moment we're wrestling with? These forms of misery and suffering, these tensions from 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, Twitter, and Mar-a-Lago. We must do, I argue, those champions do. We Gave must be better, me. we must dream better, we must act better. And no matter how late you get your political moment, you and me, we can start this work today. And it begins, and for me, I hope prayerfully will one day end, by each of us doing justice. Doing justice in our communities. Doing justice in our neighborhoods. Doing justice in our families. Doing justice in our classrooms. Doing justice in our syllabi. Doing justice in our department meetings doing justice in our media appearances, doing justice in our spending choices, doing justice for yourself and for others. This, I suggest, is our greatest challenge, and there's no better place than within ethnic studies to rise to this challenge. We must do justice, we must do justice, we must do justice now. Thank you very much.